still muted. That's my my mistake here. Good morning. Good to see you all uh, here today on Sunday the 7th of May and welcome to you if you're joining us on the live stream. I've got a few uh, announcements to make. On Monday, uh, as on the sheet we've uh, on the screen, we've got our village litter pick. Now, I'm not really <laughs> encouraging you too hard to come to litter pick because established that the village is actually quite clean at the moment so <laughs> we'll all be done in five minutes um, but I do really want to encourage you to come along to Coronation Tea Party which has been organized jointly but uh, held in the um, in Freeland Church from two to four so I hope uh, you'll be able to join us for that and eat the various buns and treats that are being prepared um, the other thing to say is that next uh, Sunday we will be starting Christian Aid, or Christian Aid Week is starting next Sunday and we will have our Christian Aid Week uh, or Christian Aid service uh, on that first Sunday so again encouragement to come along to that. We have a, a big brekkie so a sort of uh, continental style breakfast down in the hall from 9 to 10 and again that's open to anyone so even if you aren't planning to come uh, to the service or uh, whatever, you, you're welcome to come along. That's a fundraiser for Christian Aid. So that's next Sunday from 9 to 10. Uh, Dave's got bags with envelopes, etc., uh, with him today. So anyone who had said they would do a street, you can get your bag from, from Dave. And this week I'll also be sharing the uh, e envelope, so the link to our Bridge of Weir uh, online place to give to Christian Aid, which just means that we can, if, if you're going to be giving online, then um, we can keep track of what the village has raised, which is always nice for doing the statistics. Uh, I've also been asked to tell you that the Bridge of Weir Choral Society have their concert next Sunday, 14th of May, and they're doing the Mozart Requiem, so speak to uh, Archie um, if you want to find out more about that. That's next Sunday evening. I think that's all uh, my announcements. So the choir are going to lead us into worship by singing the introit. <clears throat> going to sing together, be still for the presence of the Lord. And we're reminded that Jesus promises when two or three are gathered in my name, I will be with them, because that will be 
the theme for today's service, that we find Jesus in our midst, we find Jesus among us. So let us sing this hymn with the expectancy and the hope that Jesus is present with us. Be still for the presence of the Lord. Without your presence in our midst, our worship would be empty. Our Christian lives, a meaningless experience, and our witness and service, a pointless sham. We praise you for your appearances to your disciples in the ordinary moments of life and in their everyday lives. We praise you too for the way you've come to men and women down the centuries, and that you have come into our lives too. Lord, because you are alive, and in the midst of all, we say and do and are, you enable us to declare the good news with joy and hope, and do it for your glory. Living God, we confess that often we take it for granted that we are called and invited to gather together as Christians, as your family, that you want to come among us especially when we are together. And we confess at times we neglect these opportunities to worship you, to encourage one another and to be present where you promised you would be. Life is so busy and so many things can get in the way and sometimes we just can't be bothered. As so few people in our society now go to church, it seems 
to get harder still to choose together. And it's often easier not to. Forgive us our complacency. And we also confess that at times we are physically here, but not mentally. We are not fully present and maybe low in expectations. We just go through the motions. And we confess that often we're not that enthusiastic about worship and our church fellowship to others. We're too shy to invite others along or don't expect them to join us. And we can be indifferent to those who have stopped coming or just need some encouragement or help to do so. We're slow to seek out and be present to be Christian community with our brothers and sisters who are housebound. For all these things, forgive us, renew us, restore in us your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray, surprise us, turn up when our doors and our hearts are closed and discouraged. Be in our midst, come among us today. Set our hearts on fire and reassure us of your love and your presence with us. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus Christ. And we pray now together as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to read Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. We're going to sing together, Come Now, O Prince of Peace. In the hymn book, it's down with the Advent hymns that look forward to the coming of Christ, but I think it's very appropriate, uh, really in any service, but uh, particularly with our theme today. So, Come Now, O Prince of Peace. That's 275.
knows what has happened to them. So Luke 24, starting from verse 33. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Jesus appears to the disciples. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking that they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he then asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And may God add his blessing to these readings from his most holy word.
brothers and sisters in the Lord. Today, um, our answer to the question, where to find Jesus, which is the theme of our post-Easter series, is among us. Where to find Jesus among us. We have already looked at three answers. The first one at Easter day was that he was no longer in the grave. Um, after that, we discovered that Jesus can be found in the Scriptures, both Old Testament and New Testament, with a bit of digging. And last week, when we had our old age service downstairs, we talked about how we can find Jesus at the table. So when we share life, when we share food, and where we meet like that is where Jesus can be found. Today, as I said, the answer is among us. If we want to meet with Jesus, we should meet regularly with other Christians. That's my key point today. This is where Jesus turns up, meeting regularly with other Christians so as to find Jesus. I'm not going to ask you to write it down, but I just want uh, you to take a moment and to just reflect. Think of a time where you have felt that Christ was present when you were with other Christians. So it may be here in church, or it may be in a smaller gathering, but think of a time you have felt that Christ was present when you were with other Christians. Now maybe that feels too abstract or you don't know what that's supposed to feel like, so I've got some other words for you that maybe help. Maybe a time where you felt especially encouraged or comforted, a time where you had a deep sense of peace, perhaps especially or in spite of everything else going on around you. Maybe an experience of deep joy or a sense of being really seen or heard as you are. There might even be a sense of feeling convicted quite deeply, but still the presence of God. Or maybe a time where you felt filled with hope and deeply moved. just want you to kind of mark that, uh, that experience or that, the, that time or those times uh, and hold on to that as, uh, as I preach. Now, I've got a few disclaimers for my sermon today. I'm going to obviously say, if you want to meet with Jesus, you meet, need to meet regularly with other Christians. Maybe today's message will be a bit obvious. You would expect me to tell you this, because my <laughs> job depends on it, for starters. Um, but also, it's kind of 101 of the Christian faith. It's the basics. Sometimes we do, however, need to be reminded of the obvious. I'm not preaching this to guilt trip anyone who can't come, and I'm very aware that you know we've got quite a, a large number of our congregation who are housebound, and it's great that we can now use the live stream, and, and quite a few of you are using the live stream, and I'm sure some of you would much rather physically be here, uh, but you can't. I also don't want to guilt trip anyone who's working uh, today. Or if you've fallen out of the habit uh, of coming, maybe through COVID, through life, through any of these things that can so easily happen that I can very much uh, relate to. It's very easily done. But I want to not do say these things as a guilt trip, but as an encouragement. Now, there's also, obviously, because you're here, <laughs> a danger for me to be preaching to the converted. Uh, you're already here, and... Uh, and you probably have some sense of the value of gathering with others for Christian worship. But I think it's still good to remind ourselves why gathering matters. 
There's a, if, if we're uh, convinced of that and if we can relate, uh, maybe not every week, but some experience of, of having that sense of, of that it's good to be together as God's people, then we probably uh, should be a little bit more enthusiastic and less inhibited about just simply asking someone else along, maybe someone who's kind of got out of the way coming or you just sense that they're looking for something or they might just need a bit of company uh, and, and encouragement. We should probably be less embarrassed about church. Uh, and um, I, I often struck sometimes in, in recent uh, times, you know, sometimes I do a funeral or the baptism we had recently and I was chatting to people afterwards, you know, kind of my age, and they're like, oh, actually, church is not so bad. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> you know, I think um, people, younger people especially, don't really know how church has kind of moved on from what it might have been 20 or 30 years ago, and I'm not saying it was worse then or anything, but uh, people just, if they stop coming sometime or they only have come when they were kids, they just don't really know, you know, what we do and, and uh, what it can be when, when um, yeah, when we've, when we, when we change things. So, a bit more enthusiasm, hopefully. Now, I don't know if you're into statistics, but, uh, and I probably should have put them on a slide for you to be able to process them, but I was just reading the, some of the reports for the upcoming General uh, Assembly. I'm not, I'm not going to it, but I still like to read the reports. And uh, the Assembly Trustees report was um, saying that we now have 283,600, so not quite 300,000, uh, Church of Scotland members nationally. Of that, regular attenders of church in person is about 60,000. So that makes 21%. Um, an interesting little uh, detail in that is that two out of five regular attenders are elders. So the proportion of elders to members uh, has stayed quite well, disproportionately high, really, if you look at the, uh, the decline in members, which also means there's a lot of jobs to do for um, these people. Anyway, so 60, th anyway, it was really about attendance. So 60,000, about 21% of those who say they're Church of Scotland members or are on the membership rolls. And then another, which is probably quite a new thing and a good thing, around 45,000 uh, on online worship, so a lot of congregations since, some before already, but particularly since the pandemic have, like ourselves, started live streaming, so this has enabled lots of people to also um, watch services online. Um, for comparison, I tried to find some Roman Catholic uh, services in terms of attendance to Mass, and they have experienced quite a knock because of COVID too, and they have about 100,000 uh, regular attenders now, but it, it was a lot higher before COVID. Now, the 2022 census figures aren't available yet, but in 2011, 53.8% of the population still identified as Christian. I'm sure that will, have, that will take a considerable hit in the, in the current census, but um, about 1% of the Scottish population goes to the Church of Scotland service, and if you put all the Christian services together, you probably get to 2 to 3% of the population combined attending a Christian church services. So, the last figure, so the number of the percentage of the population identifying as Christian and the percentage of people actually going regular, and that regular is a bit vague as well, but regularly to, to worship uh, is obviously a big, big difference if we have two to three percent of the population actually joining with other Christians. Um, and we've got maybe 50% of the population identifying as, as Christian. It really begs the question, can you be a Christian on your own? How do we define being a Christian? I guess if you mean Christian in a cultural sense, as in, well, I'm not a Muslim or a Jew or a Hindu or an atheist, 
then I guess that is probably the explanation why a lot of people would see themselves as Christian, as in not, not something else. And maybe a lot of people have belief in a general sense that God exists, that Jesus existed. Um, then I guess if that's your definition, then yes, you could be a Christian on your own. But in the New Testament, what makes you a Christian is the belief that Jesus is Lord. Uh, and that was a risky thing to say back in the day. That was a conscious choice and one that carried risk. So what was needed was faith or trust and obedience. The early Christians were called themselves followers of the way, the very uh, early church, because the way was the way of Christ. As Jesus had said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. So he taught a way to live, and they were followers of the way. So that immediately shows you it's more than just a general, yeah, belief there's something out there. It was a way of life uh, and, and a trust in Jesus as Lord. Then in Antioch, the first believers are first called Christians. So that you can read that in Acts 11, verse 26. And they were called Christians because they wouldn't shut up about Christ, <laughs> Jesus Christ, the Messiah. They believed, yeah, I don't need that yet um, for a little while, it's okay. So, um, so yeah, that was what made them stand out, that they lived the way that Jesus Christ had taught, that they believed Jesus was the Messiah, that he was not just Jewish Messiah, but that he was Lord over all the world. And you become a Christian through faith and through baptism, being part, becoming part of God's family, God's people, part of the body of God. So they're all collective uh, images, and I've, taught, I've preached on those before, you know these. So in that sense, you can't really be a Christian on your own, because by putting your faith in Christ, you become part of a family, you become part of the people of God, and you're part of the body of Christ, i.e. have a function in the gathered um, group of Christians. So theologically, the answer would have to be, no, you can't be a Christian on your own. Now, if we look more particularly at the gospel um, that we've uh, heard today and, and the gospels in general, we see that obviously Jesus did have one-on-ones with people and he did have uh, personal relationships with uh, individuals. But most of the time he gathered a group of people around him and we all know about the 12 that he called the disciples that would be the apostles after uh, Jesus had gone to heaven. But he also had a wider group of followers, disciples who were taught and who he shared life with. And they were all trained, in effect, for future ministry. And then we've seen over the last few weeks that even after Good Friday, after Jesus' death, the disciples hang around together in Jerusalem. They're just not quite sure whether they should be heading home, it's maybe too dangerous to start traveling, but also, you know, what's just happened and where did it go from here? We can see the beginning of a kind of breaking up of that community because the fact that these two disciples we focused on the last few weeks that, that went on their way to Emmaus, maybe, maybe they'd already decided that, you know, now everything was pointless and hopeless and there was no point in hanging around anymore and they were heading home. Um, we've also, we know that Thomas wasn't there on that first Sunday, so he must have likewise just felt there was no point in coming any longer and staying with the others. But after the two rejoin or, or go back to Jerusalem that have had this encounter with Jesus, they find the others, the 11, gathered together and some more and they're all together assembled. And then our text says, whilst they were talking, Jesus stood among them. He it just appeared in the middle of them. Other accounts, like John says that um, 
that the doors were shut because they were afraid. So somehow Jesus just appears in their midst. And initially they're scared to think he may be a ghost, but he's quite keen to prove he's not. He's got a body and therefore he eats with them and they can touch him. So Jesus meets with his disciples when they are gathered together, even though they don't all believe. Um, There's various degrees of belief and unbelief even in this story. First, they don't understand who he is, and then secondly, they are so excited that they can't believe it's actually true. But we know, you know, later the next Sunday when Thomas is part of with, of them, of part of the group, and he's with them, that, um, you know, he didn't believe that this could be true. So we can have a whole range of uh, feelings and, and beliefs and thoughts that we, are, that we are together with. And that's okay. That's part of being the church, that we're all in different places, and some will be full of enthusiasm and faith, and others just not really feeling it or discouraged or asking lots of questions because of, just because of who they are or because of where they are in their life. Um, We can see from Paul's letters to the early Christian churches that we should assume or they should assume that in their gatherings there are people there who are not believers that have maybe come along out of curiosity and that need to understand what's going on in, in, the, in the gathering. So Pete, Paul is quite clear that when they're speaking in tongues, etc., there should be interpretation, and when there's prophecies, there should be a interpretation and explanation. And the way the congregation b- behaves, the group of, of Christians is, should take account of the fact there may be those there that don't have faith or are curious or looking or skeptical, you know, that they give, um, that it, what, what is going on is understandable and that they give a good account of themselves. And even, and again, in terms of how you're feeling, you know, sometimes you're not feeling it and it can be annoying or discouraging even to be somewhere if everyone's full of enthusiasm and you kind of, in your own self, feel a bit left out. And that's always why it's such a, a balancing act to I find to put services together because even in the hymns you pick or, or the prayers you pray or the questions you ask in a sermon, you want to make sure that everyone can feel it's also for them. So whether they're in a, in a good place or in a sad place or in a, in a questioning place, uh, that, that there is something for everyone, so to speak, um, in, in the prayers and in the hymns, that it's not all, not all praise and not all... Um, doom and gloom either that that it's you know we're, we are a mixed company but the good news from for this story that we've read is that Jesus shows up in their midst with all their thoughts and their doubts and their their feelings of discouragements and being afraid you know they don't have to whip up into some enthusiastic frenzy before Jesus meets them he meets them where they are at And I think that that comes encouragement for us too, especially at this time in the life of the Church of Scotland, where so many are feeling worried about the future and feeling discouraged. Um, Jesus can still and does still show up when we gather, even when we're maybe sometimes not feeling it or we worry there's no point or we might rather just give up. Jesus still shows up. Um, if I could have the text now, just to finish, wanted to point you to this. In Hebrews 10, now we don't really know who wrote the letter to the Hebrews, but it's, it's full of rich teaching. And this is one of the kind of final exhortations in the letter. It says, uh, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who professed is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching, the day being the day that Christ returns. So this was written to Christians who were persecuted and discouraged 
and where it was certainly a lot easier just to stop gathering and to give up on the faith. But the writer says, don't give up meeting each other because you're there to encourage one another. And I think we've all experienced this when there's more of us, we are encouraged uh, that we, we gather and, and when um, you know, numbers are low, sometimes it can be discouraging. So you maybe think, well, I don't always get something out of church, and that's true, of course. Uh, sometimes, you know, the worship isn't in our liking. Maybe we don't like the hymns, or we're just not into singing, or the sermon didn't speak to us, or nobody spoke to us, or we spoke to nobody. You know, and not everyone is an extrovert, so not everyone wants to chat either. There's always a whole list of reasons why you know, church doesn't work for us. But I think our attitude with which we go to church, if we turn up expecting to meet with Christ and to be open also to meet with others and to encourage others and to be encouraged, then I think the chances that you get something out of it are are much increased. So as I say, I'm not preaching this to guilt trip you, but as the encouragement that I think is held here. And finally, that encouragement comes from what Jesus promised to his disciples. Uh, in Matthew's gospel, he said, where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. And that means here on a Sunday, but also if you go and visit someone on behalf of the church, um, or just meet in whatever, as a guild or or in small groups, just as friends going for a walk, that's where Christ is with you. And that's a terrific promise. So don't give up meeting. Jesus has called us here to meet with him. That's what we are going to sing now. Jesus calls us here to meet him, 510.
and his funeral will be held here in St. Macker's, a memorial service, uh, Wednesday the 17th, yep, <laughs> uh, at um, 12, yes, 12 noon, I didn't write it down, it's in your email that went out today. Um, the next day, the Thursday, we have a funeral service here, again, a memorial service for uh, Louise Hyde. She used to live in the Bridge of Weir, and she was well into her 90s, so uh, some of you will, I'm sure, know her. She, I think, was in the Ramfurly Castle, um, associated with the golf club there as well. Um, so she's been out the village for a number of years to be closer to her daughter, but she died um, a few weeks ago and uh, a service for her it will be held here uh, at three o'clock on the Thursday. So that's not this coming week, but th the week after. So on the Wednesday at 12 noon, it will be the service for Harold and then Thursday at 3 p.m. for Louise Hyde. So I just want to commend both families uh, in your prayers. Let us pray. Risen Lord, you still come among us today. We thank you for the promise that you gave. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I will be there. We long for your presence in our lives. Help us to continue to seek out these opportunities to gather here on Sunday, but also during the week in our homes or outside. Help us to keep the faith and keep encouraging one another. Help us to look out for one another, especially for those who are housebound or who otherwise can't be with us. Help us also to be on the lookout for those who may just need a nudge or an invitation to join with us. Help us too to let go of our own personal preferences and shape our gatherings in a way that is truly accessible and welcoming to all. And give us wisdom to discern how we go about that. We long for a revival, for a growth in our churches, both in depth and in number. And so we pray for your life-giving presence in our midst. Bring life where there only seems to be death. In Jesus' name, hear our prayer. We pray for the lonely and the isolated. So many people, young and old, struggling with loneliness and a lack of connection. So many people feeling cut off from others and lacking purpose and meaning in their lives. Lord, show us how we as individuals and as a church can connect and reach out with the lonely. In Jesus' name, hear our prayer. We pray for your church here in Scotland. In many places, congregations are discouraged and fearful of the future. It is so easy to become inward looking and defensive or to just disconnect and stop engaging with our communities or with our congregations. We pray for ministers and elders, for the faithful and the weary the cynical and the ones trying to battle on to make progress. Help us all to see green shoots and to open ourselves up to change, even where it hurts. Do a new thing, O oh God, and bring new life in the midst of death and decay. Show us what to let go of and what we might receive. In Jesus' name, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick and the dying. We pray for carers, for those with long-term illnesses. We pray for comfort and strength, connection with others, even in times of despair and grief. We pray for our world, for nations engulfed in violent conflict. We think especially of Ukraine and Sudan. Give peace in our time, O Lord. In Jesus' name, hear our prayer. And we pray a blessing on King Charles. Anoint him with the gifts of your Holy Spirit as he seeks to fulfill his calling among us. Strengthen him with wisdom and justice to serve the people of this land to the glory and honor of your name. We ask you to bless Camilla, our queen, 
William, Prince of Wales, the Princess of Wales, and all the generations of the royal family, grant to them joy and peace at this time, and inspire them by your spirit in their work. Ever-living God, you bring us together in our households, our families, and our communities, and you teach us to love one another as Christ has loved us. In these days of celebration, support us in the service of our neighbors and in pursuit of the common good of our nation and this world. May your will be done in us, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our final hymn is The Saviour Died But Rose Again. That's hymn 425. 